since uh, I'm supposed to be talking about Qigong, <laughs> I should at least give you a sample of, uh, of Qigong. And how many people have not done Qigong, any kind of Qigong? How many people have not done Qigong? So I'll just show you some simple, simple movements. Because as you know, qi Qigong is a form of um, dynamic mindfulness and it's becoming more and more popular in the West because, because not only is it very simple, it's not complicated like say Tai Chi because it's really just the upper body that moves. So it's very easy to be mindful. But the value of Qigong these days is because of stress and you can't avoid stress wherever you go. And uh, there's also emotional stress, anxiety, depression, and so on. So, so Qigong is, is a very good way of, of dealing with these uh, stresses. And you find that after you do, you do Qigong, your sitting meditation improves a great deal, maybe even 200%. <laughs> and I know personally if I'm feeling a little tired uninspired, sometimes moody when I do Qigong I usually feel at least 100% or 200% if that's possible so much better it, it's just a very wonderful thing so uh, we can stand
So you, you find that some of these practices you can actually do in the work environment. You know, so if you're feeling stress, upset, anxious, frustrated, you can do it. And if you're really upset, <laughs> just find a quiet place, you know, a quiet room, or you can go to the washroom, or you can find a stairway. There's a stairway, because stairways are usually private. And you can do the ah, do the ah one, and then the balancing. And you find even the balancing, because it's so easy, you can do it while sitting. You know, just It's so simple, but it's very beneficial. And you find to that, it's a, it's a very easy way to focus your mind, especially when you're in a busy, stressful environment. Because it's, it's, it's so accessible, it's right there in front of you. And w when I meet medical people, you know, nurses, doctors, I show them some of these, uh, these movements. Because, you know, doctors and nurses can get pretty <laughs> stressed out. And sometimes they lose focus and they make mistakes, you know, because they're human too. So that's why these practices are very beneficial. Mm. And I'll just, uh, I think some of you already know this practice. It's called dynamic mindfulness. And it's on YouTube. It has two names. One is called dynamic meditation and the other name on YouTube, it's uh, Mahasati Meditation. Hmm? Mahasati, which means great mindfulness meditation. You can see a Thai monk doing it. Yeah. And this practice is originally from Laos, yeah. but it was uh, made popular in Thailand by uh, Lung Por Tien or Achan Tien, a very, very good practitioner. And it's good not only for beginners, a good introduction to mindfulness, but it's good even for, uh, for people with practice because, you know, sometimes you try to meditate and for some reason you just can't focus your mind. This happens to all of us. Mm. And of course, when the mind is too busy, you know, too much thinking, you know, obsessing, worrying, regretting, you, you find that this practice is really good. And you, you start with your palms on, your knee on, on the knees and you start with the right hand and you just slowly, mindfully raise the right palm on the edge like this. Mm. And then lifting mm. and slowly to the stomach. Feel the touch in the st stomach area, the abdomen and then left palm up on the edge. Lifting slowly to the stomach. Feel your hand touching the other hand. And just keep your hands very loose, very relaxed, not tight. Then right hand up to the chest, touching, out, down, and down. Left hand up, touching, out, down, and down. Right. left So you're aware of each movement and when the hand touches the body. Mm. So it really brings you to the present moment.
And as we do this, just be aware of any thoughts that arise in the mind, in consciousness. Just like when you're doing mindful breathing, just be aware of those thoughts and you come back to the hand movements. So that way you just let go of those useless thoughts. And that's how we train the mind to focus and just keep letting go of those thoughts. And of course, if your if your mental activity is really strong, you can even do the mindful uh, the noting, uh, the mental noting, like thinking, 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 or worrying, worrying, worrying. Okay, mm. so you can experiment with it. And do it with your eyes open, eyes closed, you know, to see what, what is beneficial <laughs> for you. And again, this is something you can do in the work environment too. You know, if y you just have a few minutes free, you can just do it. <coughs> Very easy way to focus, focus the mind. And of course, if you know people, if you're not worrying yourself or obsessing, but if you know somebody who's worrying, you can you can share this uh, practice uh, with them because you know when people are worrying it's very hard for them to to let go of that worrying mm. and if you tell them you know that it's it's really useless it's a waste of time to worry they'll give you many many reasons why they must worry <laughs> you know because it, it's such a, a an obsession it's a habit it's a very unhealthy habit and as you know, from your own experience, worrying is really, it doesn't really help when you just worry. Mm. You know, if you can do something practical, you do it, but you, if there's nothing you can do, just worrying about it doesn't help. You know, you just get more stressed mm. and you waste a lot of mental energy. 
and because of its delusional nature, it, it makes things seem worse than they actually are. Hmm? Just like when you imagine, oh, this might happen, this might happen, this might happen. Yeah, I it's a form of uh, delusion, form of delusion. Hmm. I'd just like to do a reading here. Mindfulness is a skillful way of relating to and connecting to life and daily experience. It is paying attention on purpose in the present moment and in a non-judgmental way. It is a way of being and it takes practice. It is calm attention to what is happening from moment to moment without discrimination or criticism. It is the observing power of the mind that sees without the filter of desire or aversion, liking or disliking, or delusional reaction. It is therefore a wholesome way of seeing what is happening in the present moment. Mindful breathing brings the mind home to the body. You begin to experience calmness, a sense of well-being and quiet joy. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. This helps our concentration and focus, and we begin to appreciate the fact of being alive instead of being distracted and confused by compulsive thinking. Mindful breathing can help us to stop thinking about the past with regret and guilt, and stop thinking about the future with anxiety, fear, and uncertainty. We're able to experience tranquility and stillness, which is most beneficial and precious in our busy and stressful lives. Mindful walking helps us to be in the present moment, and we can appreciate the beauty of the environment. We can stop and smell the roses and experience the joy of just being alive. Mindful eating in silence is a peaceful activity and we can appreciate the food much more. When we're eating and talking, what we're talking about becomes more important than the food. The food becomes a secondary thing. Mindful cleaning, cooking and washing helps us to enjoy doing these activities instead of being in a hurry to finish them so that we can do other things. Present moment, wonderful moment. With mindfulness and calm focus, we can deal with our own suffering, our anxiety, fear, and worry, frustration, irritation, anger, resentment, sadness, and sorrow. You can embrace your mental, emotional upset and take care of it with compassion, kind acceptance, and patience. So mindful eating also includes the ability to put your smartphone down when you're having lunch <laughs> and stop scrolling or checking and just to eat mindfully, even for 10 minutes. Mm. You find it's a very peaceful activity. And because I don't have a smartphone, I see people all the time so fixated on their smartphones, even while having lunch. They just can't put it down because it's such a strong addiction. Yeah. And these are adults. <laughs> of course, for teenagers, it's even more difficult. Mm. Mindfulness has the power to heal past traumas and conflicts because it is a state of non-duality. And so one is able to be objective and see things as they are without identifying with them and let them go. I'll speak more about non-duality. Mindfulness also helps us not to react to unpleasant words and situations and not to take things so personally. A great deal of our mental energy is caught up in habitual reactions. It is our reactions which make us burn out, which throws us off balance and causes us suffering and discontent, dis-ease. Things get better in our lives when we react less and less. We can remain calm and patient, wise, strong, and secure. Then we can respond in a beneficial way 
and be helpful to others. Our basic problem in life is that we take things too personally, even things that are not directly related to us. This is an aspect of ignorance and delusion. Mindfulness is much more than you think. And with mindfulness, we begin to, to see and appreciate the difference between reacting and responding. Hmm? Because when we can remain calm and focused, then we're able to respond hmm? in a very beneficial way. But when we're caught up in habitual reactions, very often we're thrown off balance. Hmm? And we get you know, upset, angry, anxious and so on. So we're not really calm and focused. Mm. Our lives are not determined by what happens to us, but, but by how we react to what happens. Not by what life brings to us, but by our attitude we bring to life. The world is as it is. Life is constantly changing and uncertain. A calm and positive attitude brings a chain reaction of positive thoughts, events, and outcomes. It is a catalyst, a spark that creates extraordinary and surprising results. Events do not cause us suffering. They may cause us physical discomfort or some inconvenience and delay. It is our mental emotional reaction to those events that cause us suffering. Upset, anger, frustration, irritation, anxiety and despair. Without mindfulness, we are enslaved and deluded by mental activity, by too much thinking. This is the cause of dukkha, mental emotional disturbance. We believe that to follow our impulses and satisfy our desires and expectations is freedom. This is an illusion. In fact, we are slaves to craving clinging, frustration, fear, and despair. In mindfulness, one is not only restful, calm, and happy, but alert and awake. Meditation is not an evasion or escape. It is a clear and serene encounter with reality. Our minds are conditioned to react. Our brains are programmed, educated, to label, judge, criticize, condemn, compare, to like or dislike, to want or not to want, to have aversion and ill will. This is a conditioning of our mental defilements. So this is the cause of our conflicts, discontentment, disharmony, and dis-ease. The idea of a permanent, unchanging ego center or self is strengthened by this conditioning. And it is this deep-rooted illusion of a permanent, concrete, and separate ego entity which is the source and cause of our problems and conflicts, fears and worries, cravings, greed, and attachment. We can skillfully deal with our thoughts and emotions. With objective awareness of our mental landscape, we can see thoughts as just thoughts, feelings as just feelings, moods and emotions as just moods and emotions. We can see and understand their impermanent, changing, and uncertain nature, and can therefore let them go, freeing the mind of suffering and dis-ease. Now mindfulness or present moment awareness is a state of non-duality. Now, what does that mean? It means that there is no I, no self, being aware. Hmm? There's no I or self being mindful. Hmm? There's only that energy of attention, hmm? that energy of consciousness. Now, initially, we don't see that. Hmm? Only when we practice, then we can see this. And this was one of the insights of the Buddha. And why we don't see this initially is because by habit we identify hmm, with all our experiences. 
Mm-hmm. And so we create a duality. Mm-hmm. For example, the condition of duality starts very innocently, you know, as a young child. You know, when a child begins to say, you know, I like this or I don't like this. Mm-hmm. It's very innocent. You know, you create, you create an I, eh, a subject, a subject and an object. And then this conditioning of duality becomes more deep-rooted when we begin to identify with our sense experiences. Hmm? I am seeing something. Hmm? I am hearing something. Hmm? I'm tasting something. I'm, f- I'm smelling something. I'm feeling something by touch. And of course, I'm thinking. Hmm? I'm thinking something. Now, what is very interesting, when we start to practice we begin to see that the senses are actually sensing by themselves. Hmm? It, it, they happen automatically, hmm? don't they? Hmm. For example, you don't have to make any special effort to see. Hmm? As long as your eyes are healthy and you open your eyes, seeing consciousness arises automatically. Hmm? Likewise, hearing. Hmm? As long as you ears are healthy, hearing is automatic, isn't it? Hmm? Likewise, you start to eat something and tasting, consciousness arises automatically. Hmm. And if you're not sure about this, the next time you eat something, just say to yourself, okay, I'm going to eat this thing very mindfully and I'm going to try not to taste this. Hmm? See what happens. You can't avoid tasting. Mm. As long as we have taste buds on the tongue, tasting consciousness will arise. Mm. Mm. The same with smelling. As long as our, if your nose are not stuffed up, smelling consciousness arises automatically. Mm. And of course, when the body touches something, that touch sensation happens automatically. The same with thinking. Mm. Most of the time, we're not even aware that we're thinking thinking it was happening automatically, and and we're not aware of it. Mind is just busy thinking, and of course we are caught up in everything that the mind is creating. Hmm? Mm -hmm. We believe all the stories that the mind is telling us. Hmm? And that's why we're easily deluded by the mind, because we identify so strongly with the thinking process. And every time the mind says, I, you know, I this, I that, we think this I is who we are. Mm. So this is one of the awakenings of the Buddha. He realized that the thought process and this I was not who he really was. Mm. And who he really was was the awareness, the knowing, mm. that can see the impermanent nature mm. of thoughts. Mm. And he understood that the I was just a, a social label hmm? that we all have to use hmm? when we say I. It's really just a social label hmm? that we learn you know, from early childhood. So when we say first there is seeing something and there's a knowing, there's an intuitive knowing that w- you recognize something that you see, hmm? which is the nature of perception, you're able to recognize something because of memory. Mm. And in this part of the world, the smell of durian is unmistakable. The moment you smell durian, you know exactly what it is. Mm. Even if, if you're in a Western country, or even if you happen to be in the North Pole or South Pole, if you happen to smell durian, you know exactly what it is, no doubt. That's the power of perception. But because we have that habit of identifying with these sense experiences, as we said, we create a duality. Hmm? I am seeing something. Hmm? I am hearing something. We create a duality. Hmm? Subject and an object. Hmm? The subject is I as the seer Hmm? of something. Hmm? Or the I as the listener or the hearer separate from sound. Mm. Just like the eye as a taster that is tasting the food. 
the eye as a smeller that is separate from the smell or the odor. Mm, the eye as a feeler of that touch sensation. And of course the eye as a thinker separate from thoughts. Mm. But in fact there is really no seer separate from the object. There's, there's really no, uh, no um, listener or hearer that is actually separate from the sound. Uh, as we said, these experiences happen by themselves. It's a very profound uh, realization, but when we reflect on it, when we, we practice, we begin to see this. Mm. Just that how the duality is created by this habit we have of, of uh, identification like this. And of course, there is no thinker separate from thoughts. Because hmm? we tend to say, you know, I'm thinking these thoughts, or I'm thinking those thoughts, or I shouldn't be thinking those thoughts, I should be thinking these thoughts. So you, you think that there's a thinker separate from thoughts. But it's an illusion, because when you practice, you begin to see that the thinker, the I, is actually a part of thinking. Hmm? And there's a very good exercise you can do. For example, just close your eyes and just think these three thoughts. I am thinking. I am thinking. <coughs> Again, I am thinking. One more time, I am thinking. You see that I is a thought, am is a thought, thinking is a thought. So I am thinking are just three thoughts. In other words, the I is not separate as a thinker. Do you see that? Because mm, normally when you say, I'm seeing something, I'm hearing something, I'm smelling something, I'm tasting something, I'm feeling something by touch, and of course I am thinking something, the I feels separate, doesn't it? Mm, the I feels separate. And that feeling of separation is what is is caused by this duality, the conditioning of duality. Mm. It's very profound, but once you reflect and you practice, you begin to see that. Mm. That there's no I as a thinker separate from thought, it's just thinking. And it's because of this illusion of a separate I as a thinker why some of the early forest yogi yogis they would sit and they would try to stop thinking. Mm. I am going to stop thinking. And I think this is how migraine headaches began. Because <laughs> they didn't realize the I as a thinker is not separate from thoughts. Mm. It's, like, it's like thoughts is trying to stop thoughts. You see that? Mm. Because it's an illusion. You said one time a cousin of mine in Canada, she went to this meditation class and the instructor said, okay, focus on your breathing and then try to think of nothing. Of course, they all end up with headaches. They're very unskillful, you know, these crazy people. Mm. Yeah, try not to think of, of nothing. It's like somebody is telling you, try not to think of a pink elephant with blue polka dots and wearing a yellow hat. Try not to think of that. <laughs> so, we often hear or read, you know, that the cause of suffering or dukkha is craving. That's one cause, of course. But the other cause is this habit we have of clinging, of identifying with things. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a physical body, 
this is me or mine, and we identify with mental and emotional states. And what is unfortunate as human beings is that whatever we identify with, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional, are not permanent. Mm. Whatever we identify with are subject to change. Mm. And this is one of the causes of dukkha. Mm. For example, a happy feeling arises, and naturally we say, I am happy. It seems so natural. Unhappy feeling arises, we say, I am unhappy, mm. or I'm sad, or I'm upset, mm. or I'm frustrated, mm. or I'm bored, or I'm afraid. So when we have this habit of identifying with these feelings and emotions, we hold on to them as something personal. Mm. And that's how we take things so personally. I know this is a big problem in North America. People take things so personally, you know, and they're so ego-centered. Even things that are not directly related to them, somehow they take it personally. Mm. The, it's a part of the North American conditioning. Mm. And that's why the Dharma is so challenging, especially for Westerners, but at the same time, it can be so liberating eh? once we understand it and we practice, we train the mind. We can see through the cause of, of dukkha. Mm. Now, initially when we say, I am happy, when we identify with something that feels good, there is no dukkha. Mm. No conflict, no upset, no disturbance. But when we identify with something which is unpleasant, immediately there is dukkha. And as we said, we hold on to it as something personal. And what is interesting is that when we become too attached to anything that's pleasant, eventually we experience frustration and depression or despair simply because whatever feels good or what makes us happy is subject to change and is a part of our human nature that anything that feels good anything that's pleasurable we want it to be permanent or we want to we want it to last as long as possible mm. and that's why Inevitably, uh, we experience frustration. Hmm. So this is why in the practice of mindfulness, because it's a state of non-duality, you know, there's no I being mindful or no I being aware. It gives us that ability. That's a great miracle of mindfulness. We're able to see things as they are, objectively. Mm. So, for example, in saying, instead of saying, I am angry, or I'm upset, or I'm afraid, we can apply mindfulness and we can say, there is. Mm. Yeah, there is a state of anger. No, there is anger. There is upset, or oh, there's a state of upset, there's a state of frustration, there is fear, not I am afraid, mm, or I am bored, or I am lonely, mm, there is a state of loneliness, and you begin to see the difference, mm, very big difference in saying, you know, I am angry, and there is anger. You see anger as it is, instead of grasping at it, identifying with it. You see, yes, it's there. Fear is there. Frustration is there. Even jealousy. Even craving. Mm. But you see it as it is. 
And then with wisdom, we can remind ourselves, this too shall pass. Mm? It is impermanent. Mm? It is changing. And these four words contain the greatest wisdom in human experience. This too shall pass. This is a very good reminder. And then we come back to present moment, mindfulness, whatever practice you're doing, and you allow that feeling or emotion to pass away mm. without struggle, mm. without <laughs> control, without suppression. And also you find that when we don't identify with emotions or mental states, we don't, we don't create conflict about that feeling or emotion. For example, if I say, you know, anger arises and I say, I am angry, a common reaction is, oh my God, this is terrible, I shouldn't be angry. Mm. I'm such a bad Buddhist or I'm such a bad monk, or I'm such a bad meditator. Mm. Now I'll never become an arahant. <laughs> mm. I'll never experience, you know, ten jhana. <laughs> you, you see the conflict? and you, you feel guilty, right? You feel guilty about being angry. The same with jealousy. You know, you identify with jealousy. I am jealous. Same thing. Oh, this is terrible. I shouldn't be jealous. I should be happy, I should have sympathetic joy, mudita, instead of feeling jealous. And so the guilt is there. Mm. Mm. Terrible, bad karma. Mm. I'm going to have bad rebirth <laughs> or bad reincarnation in my next life. And all these guilts that we, we experience. So that's one of the great benefits of objectifying these feelings and emotion. Just see them as they are, so there's no conflict, no guilt. See them as they are, know they're impermanent, and we let them go. Mm. And when emotions are very strong, as you know, it's not easy to sit with strong emotions. Mm. Whether it's anger, frustration, upset, and of course, depression, not easy. And this is where something like Qigong comes in. Mm. Because by moving and breathing, you're able to release uh, the energy of those emotions, mm. especially anger. Because <laughs> as you know, anger is a very illogical, very strong illogical emotion. Mm. That's why it's very useful to to have the skill to know the skill that if anger arises you know frustration upset we know how to deal with it mm. a very logical emotion mm. and, and, and as you know from experience say if you're if you're angry with your partner or even with a good friend you tend to forget all their good qualities mm, and all the good things they have done and all the good experiences that you have shared with these people. That's the nature of anger. Mm. And sometimes, say, if you're angry with a good friend, and another friend comes and says, Why are you angry with this friend? He's such a good person. You know, and he done all these things. But you're so angry and irrational, you also get angry at that other friend. <laughs> Because that other friend is not supporting your anger. Mm. That's the nature of anger. Yeah. So it's very beneficial when we can skillfully deal with it. Mm. And um, as you may know, Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, the well-known Vietnamese uh, teacher, he has a very wonderful way of dealing with feelings and emotions, with mindful breathing and smiling. You know that one. Breathing in, I know there's upset in me. Breathing out, I smile. Mm. And you smile at it mindfully. Breathing in, I know 
There's craving in me, breathing out, I smile. Breathing in, I know there's fear in me, breathing out, I smile. Breathing in, I know there's frustration in me, breathing out, I smile. It's a very beneficial practice. Because that mindful smiling is a smile of metta, mm, of loving kindness and acceptance. Because you're not judging it. Mm, you're not judging it. You're not criticizing it. You accept it with a smile of metta. That's why it is so beneficial. And again, you remind yourself, this too shall pass. Mm. And you find to the mindful smiling it's very wholesome, huh? it's a very wholesome state of mind. Because when you smile, it's very positive and it helps us to relax, to be more peaceful. And that's why now we're, we're having practices like, you know, laughing yoga, you know, laughing, it's, it's the same thing. You can also have laughing qi, qigong too. <laughs> you, ac you can extend that, ah, to laughing, it's the same thing, just releasing, releasing these uh, emotions. Mm. And also mindfulness helps us not to react mm, so, so, so readily, so easily. Mm. Because this, this is part of our conditioned behavior mm, from, from childhood. You're always reacting. You know, judging, criticizing, liking, not liking, comparing, sometimes condemning, mm. wanting, not wanting, and so on. Mm. This is why it has been said really that life is 10% of things happening and 90% of or just reacting. Mm. And it's really true when you, you observe it. Life is mostly this, 90% reacting. And our reactions is what creates uh, our reality. We think this is real, this is what reality is. Hmm. And this is why the, the Buddha gave such a radical and challenging teaching when he said, when you see, just see. When you hear, just hear. Very challenging. <laughs> it sounds simple but it's very challenging. Right? But if you be begin to practice this, you begin to see the great benefits, the great freedom of not reacting. Mm -hmm. This is why sometimes I tell people they can use that simple qigong, just breathing and smiling. Mm -hmm. If somebody is being unpleasant to you, or you're in an unpleasant situation, instead of reacting to it, just focus just breathe and smile. It's very useful. Mm. And by doing so, you can ignore that person who's trying to be unpleasant. <laughs> and they'd be very puzzled. They'd be very puzzled <laughs> with what you're doing. Mm. Because in, is, is in the end, it's our reaction, right? How we react to a situation or what people are saying uh, that determines our, our mental state. Mm. And this is why when, uh, when, when people get angry at us, it, it's a good opportunity for us just to keep mindful and not to react to that person's anger. But of course, it takes practice. Because you find that when you don't react to somebody's anger or unpleasantness, you see that they're suffering. Mm. But if you react also with anger, then you don't see that. Beca because both of you are suffering. Mm. You're caught up in that emotion. And and when you see that somebody is suffering because you're, you're able to remain calm and objective, then naturally compassion will arise. Mm. 
and you want to improve that situation. Mm. And one way is just to say, I'm really sorry that you're angry or you're, you're upset. Mm. Please tell me what I did or what I said to make you upset. Mm. Because maybe you did do something or y you did say something but you're not aware of it. And if you're blameworthy, then you say, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. Mm. And you find too very often it's a misunderstanding. Mm. Very often it's, it's a misunderstanding. Mm. Or, you know, somebody misinterpreted what you said. It happens all the time in human relationship because we're human, you know. Mm. And if it's a misunderstanding, then you make the effort to, to clear up this misunderstanding. Mm. And you find that when you do, both parties feel much better. You, you feel much more positive to realize it's just a misunderstanding. Mm. And if somebody is not reflective or not receptive to your approach, you just say, I see you later when you're feeling much better, and you walk away. You know the saying, see you later, alligator? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes you try to reason with somebody, and you, you just can't. You just say, yeah, see you later. <laughs> mm. You know, once... Um, this friend of mine was working for a company for three months, a temporary project, and the supervisor was this lady who was obviously having a difficulty at home. And most mornings she would come and she would just behave in a very unprofessional way. Mm. In the West we say bitching, you know, bitching. She was just bitching at everyone. And she wasn't aware of her behavior. She was just acting out, you know, all the frustration, the anger from home. So my friend said to me, can you suggest something? Hmm? How to deal with this very difficult, challenging person? So I said, yes, you can try this, but you must try it. Don't be afraid, don't be shy. And I said, you're only there for three months anyway. <laughs> He said, the important thing is not to get angry with her. Mm. Stay calm. And one morning, you know, when she's behaving like that, just say to her calmly, I'm really sorry that you're not feeling well today. Mm. Please tell me how I can help you. And he tried it, and it, it, it helped a lot. Yeah, he, he called me a few days later, and he says, thank you so much. It really helped. Because first by saying to her, I'm really sorry that you're not feeling well today, it made her aware of her mental state. Because before she wasn't, she was just acting out. And then by saying to her very calmly, very kindly, please tell me how I can help you, she responded to that kindness. Because she obviously was suffering. So the next time you're having difficulty with a co-worker or your supervisor, maybe you can try that. <laughs> and if they're not receptive, see you later, alligator. <laughs> Regarding Qigong, uh, th there's a very interesting story. Uh, I was once doing a one day of mindfulness at a Sri Lankan temple in uh, Christchurch. New Zealand, and they had to move the temple because of the earthquake. They had these two big earthquakes, 2011. <laughs> and there was a lady there, and she was very unhappy. Mm. And she told everyone about her unhappiness. And basically, she was unhappy because her son moved out of the house. He moved in with his girlfriend, but the, uh, her daughter was still with her. 
and she was unhappy because the, her son refused to visit her. And she made the mistake of spoiling and pampering her son because the father had died very young, when he was young. So she felt she should really spoil and pamper him because he was without a father. Big mistake. Because you know when you spoil and pamper a child, they grow up being very immature, you know, very self-centered, very demanding. So the son was like that. And apparently his girlfriend was very uh, insecure, you know, very controlling, very jealous. So I said to her, you can't really depend on your son for your happiness. Hmm. You just have to be patient and maybe in a few years time, you know, he'll become more mature and then he'll come and visit you. But you should be grateful, at least your daughter is at home and she's very kind, very supportive person. You have to be grateful for that. And also I said, you must understand that your son is also suffering mm, because he's with a very insecure and controlling <laughs> a young lady. So he has his own suffering. <laughs> and then I said to her, when you start practicing mindfulness, you begin to see that what is really causing you suffering is not your son per se, but it's your obsessive thoughts about your son, you know, not visiting. That is where you see the dukkha. It's in the mind. Mm. Yeah, you can't depend on your son for your happiness. This is what you have to work on. And this is what the Dharma teaches us about the mindfulness. See it in the mind. And what was very interesting, after we had the discussion, we went outside, beautiful weather, and we, b we began to do Qigong. And during the Qigong, he just completely changed. He started smiling, moving and breathing, and everyone saw the difference in her. Because everyone knew how unhappy she was. He com she was able to let go of those obsessive thoughts about her son, just by breathing and moving. Of course, we're doing the laughing and the ah, qigong. So it's very, it was very nice to see that. Mm. She was able to let go of those obsessive thoughts. Mm. So that's one of my promotion uh, stories about qigong. <laughs> Are there any questions? How many? Depends on how frustrated, stressed, <laughs> angry, you know. <laughs> I would say for each movement, uh, just a few minutes, just a few minutes, yeah. Mm. I think Brother Bobby has the, the link, I think, on YouTube. The video is there. The link is on, um, I think I gave it for the Qigong on YouTube. He's not mindful today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll give it to you afterwards. Yeah, the, the video is on, is on, is on Qigong here. Yeah is on YouTube, yeah, and it's very simple. It's so simple. Mm. Hi, um, can I ask a slightly personal question about something you said? You said that you yourself experience this frustration. Uh, I find it very hard to believe because you're <laughs> like a picture of Zen. I believe you, you live in the lap of the gods and all. Can you just share what actually <laughs> frustrates uh, someone who's you know uh, practices Zen on a, a very regular basis? Yeah. Sorry if it's a bit too personal, but yeah. I give a simple reason. I'm human. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I experience almost everything that you experience. Mm. You just have better control of uh, responding to it. That's right. That's right. Okay, thank you. Because frustration comes 
when, when you have a certain desire, you have a certain wish, or you want something to, to go according you know, to the way you want it to go, and it doesn't. So the frustration is there. And once I experienced, uh, let's see, 2007, a group of, uh, there's a group in PJ. By chance, they found a copy of my book. It was just collecting dust in the corner of somebody's room, and they discovered it, and they showed it to their teacher. And the teacher liked it very much, and he began to draw attention to this book. And suddenly, I got email from a few members. I was back in Canada, and they said, oh, we've discovered your book, we like it so much, and, or, and, um, and we hear that you visit Malaysia sometimes, so next time you come to Malaysia, let us know, and we'll arrange so many programs for you. <coughs> and I had planned to go to uh, UK that, that winter, because the, the previous winter I was here, but that group didn't, hadn't discovered my book. And, um, and then my, my second book, The Travel Journal, it's online, I, I can give you the, the link. It became uh, printed after many months of delay. So I thought the conditions are really good. Mm. The second book has been printed after much delay and then this group has discovered my book. So I canceled my visit to the UK and oh. I decided to come for the following winter. And my friends were really surprised to see me that early. <laughs> so anyway, they arranged all these things for me. And I've never been so busy in my life for three months. <laughs> and I got a little taste of what you call celebrity. <laughs> Fame. Initially, it was exciting, you know, because you're geared up for it. But after three months, because, you know, I get a, a three-month chop. Once the three-month chop was over, I had to leave for Singapore. Oh. And when I got to Singapore, it's like, ah, oh. I'm happy that's all over. Because, <laughs> you know, you can get busy, you right. and naturally stress is there. But fortunately, the Qigong helped. And when the group heard that I did Qigong, they arranged almost every morning at a park <laughs> in PJ. Qigong, Qigong, and more people were joining. And some people were surprised to see a monk doing Qigong. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very interesting experience, but I began to realize too that, you know, being popular, being famous is also a source of stress. <laughs> Uh, being a PJ resident, I apologize on behalf of those PJ people. <laughs> no, no need, no need. <laughs> no need. And also, you see that uh, fame is um, it's impermanent. Hmm? It, it doesn't last. And you find that, you know, all the Hollywood people in, in movies, in television, you know, for a moment they're famous. Because you know their movies, their shows, you know, have been well received. Yeah, but then it, it passes. But what happens? What keeps people in the limelight, so to speak, is the media. Right? Is the media keep keeps people popular like this? Hmm. Um, also, can I ask? Um, do you do your Qigong first before you do meditation? Is it preparation for meditation for you? Uh, sometimes, sometimes, okay. yeah. But, uh, but when I do Qigong, like with a group, it, it really helps them a lot mm, to, do, to meditate. Mm. Thank yeah, you. Much better, yeah. And, uh, and when I'm I in a place where, uh, like a very busy city environment, and then people come directly from work, and I would do at least 20 minutes of Qigong, like we just did, <laughs> just to get people to, to focus, to release that stress. You, f you find that they can sit much better. Yeah. But I don't know if you know the tradition of meditation. It actually ca came from the yoga. 
yoga tradition. The early forest monks did yoga. That's how it all started. And then from doing all the yoga asanas, you know, the bending, stretching, mindfulness of the body, breathing sensations, then when they sat, it was easy. Because the body would be very relaxed, the mind would be very calm, very focused. Yeah. That's how it started. Mm. Mm. But now in North America, especially the American, they have created all these crazy types yeah. of yoga yeah. now. Uh, yeah. Yoga. yeah, workout yoga, intense yoga, hot yoga. Yeah, it's more like aerobics. Mm. They have this aerobic, aerobics, uh, you know, workout mentality. It's not something which is calm, mindful, like this. Yeah. Believe me, only the crazy Americans would come <laughs> up with these yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, they want things to be more fast, more intense. You know, yeah. It's very interesting. Bhante, the phrase, this too shall pass, uh, how do we prevent ourselves from developing a sense of empathy, uh, you know, um, sorry, apathy uh, in all situations if we just say that this too shall pass? In the sense of, uh, you know, if we say this too shall pass, then we just don't do any, take any actions uh, because of the of, a, of a adopting the attitude that this too shall pass and that, you know, it's just a matter of time. It, it shall pass, so yes, you don't I have to do yes. anything. So. Yeah, yeah. Now I understand your question. You try to do what you can. That's the important thing. You're responding in a beneficial way. But if you can't, you have to learn to accept that. But you do what you can. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it just, uh, I just don't want to have that danger of developing a sense of apathy against mm. that, that mm. we just don't take action. Mm. So how to prevent ourselves from developing that kind of attitude of that? Yes, it, it's good to have this, this two shall pass because then we don't get threatened. But at the same time, my only worry is that Yes. Mm. So this is why you have to be mindful of that worry, that doubt in your mind. Because if you have the mindfulness, the wisdom, then you can respond. As I said, instead of just reacting. You know, in other words, you try to do what you can. But if you can't, you have to ex accept your limitation also. Which is a part of compassion instead of feeling guilty. And it's, this is one of the things I learned when I was once doing a volunteer work in Calcutta, the home of the dying. You know, they find people who are very sick, very dying on the streets, and they would come to the center. And initially, because you have the, you know, this, your Western ego, you want to save everyone in Calcutta. And all the, you know, so, many, so much poverty, sickness, dying. You want to save them all. But when you're there and you're facing this reality, yeah. there's no end to it. There's just no end. And you have to accept your limitations. Otherwise, you burn out. You really, you burn out. And compassion is what gives you the, the patience to d just do what you can. And if you cannot help someone today, Tomorrow, you try and do your best. Mm. Yes. That reminds me of a story. Do we have one? Um, uh, I'm a little, yeah, okay. D don't worry about time. <laughs> We're actually living in a timeless universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but humans are trapped in, in the conditioning of time. This, this one gentleman it came, it came to the, these classes I was having in, in Toronto in, at the university downtown. And he was very angry, very frustrated because he was involved in environmental issues. 
hmm, trying to save the planet, the forests, the whales, all that stuff. And you know, he went to a lot of conferences, did a lot of networking with others, like-minded people. And they're all frustrated, very angry, because they realize that most governments are not interested in these issues. Mm, it's all about power, you know, mo money, m multinational corporations, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I said to him, you have good intention, but you have no wisdom. He said, what do you mean by that? <laughs> 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 Not a happy guy. <laughs> I said, you have good intentions, which is good, but you're too anxious to achieve something. Because what you're facing now is this obstacle hmm, of not getting enough support from world governments. So you have to accept those limitations and learn to be patient. And just do what you can, but you have to be patient. And this is where the practice comes of mindfulness. And then I gave him the example, and this has happened so many times in human history, where you have a good leader, and during his lifetime he's able to do a lot of good for the people. And then he dies, and guess who takes over? His son, you know, who's totally different. Spoiled, pampered, egocentric, ruthless, power hungry, you know. And he completely undoes all the good things that his father had done. Because life is uncertain. So when I gave him that example, I said, yes, you do what you can, but you have to reflect on the truth of impermanence. Because even in your lifetime, if you're able to, uh, do, uh, to achieve a lot in, in this environmental work, when you die or you, you can't do any more, there are no guarantees hmm, what will happen after. So after doing some practice and some reflection, he became a much wiser and much uh, calmer person. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, if I had a chance to speak with them, I would mention this, yeah. yeah. I think part of it, too, is just the stress. You know, there's a, they're just releasing a lot of stress, a lot of frustration. Because, as you know, Hong Kong is a very stressful environment, yeah. It's even worse than Singapore. It's worse than Singapore. Mm. Mm. And they're very materialistic, very materialistic in Hong Kong. You know, and they're crazy about, you know, these, you know, these um, brand name items yeah. from Europe. Really crazy about it. And very often, co-workers will even compete against each other. Who can outdress each other with all these, you know, expensive brand name items? <coughs> yeah. it's, it's delusion, of course. And the irony is that in the end, they all end up looking the same. <laughs> Yeah, because it's the same fashions and accessories and so on. Yeah, it's, it's the illusion of life, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> mm.
on behalf of BGF, thank you so much for attendance and thank you Bante so much for your insightful talk. Um, we would like to offer uh, Navakama to Bante for his Dhammajutta work and I call uh, on behalf of uh, Barbobi, can you receive this Namakama on behalf of Bante? Mm. Brother Bobby. 